Hey, what's up guys? Have you ever seen a 3D printer like this and thought to yourself, I wonder if I can make any money printing stuff? Well, I'm here to tell you the answer is absolutely yes. How do I know? Because I've actually personally done it. So that's what I wanna do is first, just go over my personal experience and what it was like for me and just kind of share my story. Then I wanna give tips and advice for anybody that's considering running a 3D printing farm. You know, I've learned a lot and I think I could bring a lot of value to somebody that's about to take that journey. And then at the end of the video, I'd like to talk about other ways I think you can make money 3D printing and just kind of my opinion on which ones I think would or wouldn't work and what the experience would be like. But again, I can't say for sure. All I can talk about is how I've personally done it. So when I first got a 3D printer, I had a problem that I needed to solve and that's why I bought the printer. And I just think it's incredible how today, if you have this idea in your head and you have access to a computer and a couple hundred bucks to buy a printer, you can manifest that and bring it into reality and make a prototype. I mean, just think about how many people had these great ideas in the last century, but just didn't have the resources to manifest them into reality. So yeah, I have a saltwater aquarium. I had this problem. I bought a 3D printer. I solved the problem. If you're really interested in like what I did and the product I made, I'll put a link in the description. It's on another YouTube channel I have, but it'll be a video that explains everything that I did and what the product is if you're curious. But the point is, is that I made a product for myself that solved a problem. So then I thought, hmm, let's turn this into a business. And again, it's just incredible how technology makes it so easy nowadays to do things like validate a product by marketing it and then making sure that people actually like it and wanna buy it. So to get my product out there in the world, all I did was make a YouTube video, the one I linked down in the description. And in order to sell it, I just made a quick Shopify website, put the product up for sale and bam, orders started rolling in. And through this journey, I have learned a tremendous amount and it's been actually a lot of fun. You know, I've learned about post-processing, shipping, inventory, and definitely how to maintain 3D printers. And I've gotten some really, really good customer feedback. So good, in fact, that one customer showed me a way that I could literally cut the cost in half and make the product better. So the next step in my journey on that little adventure is gonna to be to release that version two. And really what I'd like to do is get enough people interested in it to make a Kickstarter and raise the money to get an injection mold. Cause honestly, 3D printing is kind of a pain in the butt. For the amount of time and energy that goes into the post-processing, shipping, answering emails, all that kind of stuff. If I put that time into one of my other businesses, I'll get a much better ROI. So I'm kind of at a crossroads. You know, I don't wanna kill the idea, but I don't wanna be doing the 3D printing anymore. So if I can raise enough money for a Kickstarter, I'll probably go that route, but that's not even settled or anything. I just wanted to give you an ending to that story and kind of why I don't have the 3D printer farm going up right now and whatnot. So now let's jump into the second part of the video and explain what I've learned from running a small print farm and the tips that I would give to anybody that's considering doing that. And hey, look, this just got done. Like I said, you can literally print money. All right, so you'll notice one thing with all these tips is that simplicity is the key. So the very first thing is I would strongly recommend getting one kind of printer. Do your research, you know, do you need direct drive, Bowden, what kind of size printer do you need, that sort of thing. But don't go with something radically new, go with something that's been tried by others and has been shown and known to be reliable. That's gonna be one of your biggest things. And you just want one printer. Some obvious reasons that might come to your head is, well, you know, if it breaks, replacement parts, they're all the same. I can swap them out. I can order the same parts and have backups. That's all true, but really, for me, the biggest reason was that all the printers print differently. And when you print, you have to make some G code and like slice it is what they call it. And maybe my print was a little bit more difficult than most in terms of like, there was a lot of supports and retraction and things that could happen with stringing. And I had to print in uh, PETG, which could create some issues. But what I'm saying is I couldn't just take the file, put it in the new printer and press print. I had to tinker sometimes for weeks to get it to print right. All right, so just to show you some examples, this right here could have came out perfect on one printer and then looked like this on a different printer. Really demonstrates why you don't wanna switch printers because this could be the exact same print setting, but this is one printer, this is the other printer. And that's actually true. This is my Artillery X1 setting. Basically, I matched all the numbers and this is printed on the FL Sun. Now I can get the FL Sun to print like this, but it took me a very long time to dial in those settings. 
there's actually a lot that goes into it and keeping all these different G codes, which is basically like the file to print for the different printers and trying to remember it all can be really difficult, but there probably is a way to increase efficiency and increase speed. And I could spend a lot of time figuring that out but if I figured that out for one printer, now I have to figure it out a totally different way for a different printer. So having one printer is gonna make your life way easier. All right, so with that theme, one kind of plastic is gonna be best. Now there's a bunch of different things you can be printing and stuff. I had to print in PETG. Not all PETGs are the same. So I would order it from this company, see, oh, it's, hey, cheaper now, there's a sale here, so I'm gonna get it here, and then I would just throw it in the printer and think it's gonna come out fine, not even close like surprisingly different. And now again, my file was a little bit difficult to print, but there's all these new issues that come up and it can be really annoying. Even different colors will have different printing properties. It could be brand A, you know, we've got black and we've got blue and they're gonna print a little bit differently. If you can, PLA is by far the easiest. I know some of these like videos and information are out there is like, oh, PETG is the new thing. And it's like, you know, just as good. And why wouldn't you use it? No, 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 PLA is way easier to print than PETG. Trust me, it is miles easier. And the easier it is to print, the more success you're gonna have. So I wouldn't offer you know different things like, oh, I could do ABS or PLA or whatever. I would stick with one kind of plastic and keep your, you know, they'll call them SKUs, as small as possible. Now, whatever niche or thing you're doing, that might not be possible, but if it is possible and you have the choice, do not make the choice to add on SKUs or add on colors and all this customizable stuff because it's only going to create issues for you. And I know in some cases you're like, well, it'll increase sales. I would definitely test that. And if it doesn't increase sales, don't overcomplicate it. You got to remember that your time is worth money as well. So if you get a deal and save, you know, a couple bucks on a roll of plastic, that couple dollars might end up a whole day's worth of tinkering to get that to print really good and not have issues. So even if you're gonna offer different SKUs and whatnot, I would find reliable, good plastic that you can always get and reorder and just stick with the ones that you know and just stick with those to keep things smooth and rolling. What's nice about just using one kind of plastic is you can use the entire roll and just open one package at a time. Because if you open up 10 different colors and packages and you just let them sit there, depending on your climate, that might create some issues. You know, luckily I live in a really dry climate, but if it was super humid, that's gonna cause issues to that filament and I would have had to been like drying them out before I printed. And it's just a lot easier if you're doing one at a time, you're opening up the sealed bag, going through it relatively quickly to where it's not exposed for months and you're gonna have less issues with the filament and really what I want to show with this example is what post-processing is or finishing the product. So this is an example of like not a good print. There's lots of stringing. You can see the overhang didn't come out right. Uh, it's got, you know, this drooping stuff over here. But if you're able to change the print settings and eliminate as much of the post-processing as possible, you can make a lot more money because if time is money, you know, this could take 15 minutes to get ready to sell if it's even salvageable, which it really isn't because of these globs here and stuff, where you could dial in the print settings to eliminate the stringing, make sure that these supports come out well and be able to do this in like a couple minutes. So these are called supports. And in order to print, you know, this is the bottom of the print. It can't just make this line that goes across here. It needs support. Otherwise, if it tried to just print that, it would droop like a piece of spaghetti. Let me show a finished product, what it looks like. You know, you're gonna have a nice clean line right there. And on the bottom of these, as you can see here. So this would be an example of a good print. This is one that needs a lot of post-processing. So let's pop these guys out. And you can see some of them come out, some of them are, are sticking here. So when you're making your print, you can actually adjust how far away the supports are. You know, basically your distance on the Z axis and your distance on the X, Y axis. So that's just one step. And you can see this is still super ugly and not sellable. So a handy tool is this deburring tool here to where you can try to clean up these edges. I might be able to get rid of this support. As you can see how there's all these like little globs right there and get all those off real quick with just one quick stroke. And you can see that looks nice. Hopefully it picks it up on camera, but you could end up printing something and spend a long time trying to make this look like this 
or you can spend the time in your slicer program and it's just trial and error. You print one, you see what's wrong with it, you make tiny little adjustments and you continue that process and hopefully you're able to come up with something that looks a lot cleaner like this. And for the stringing, the big strings you'll definitely wanna get rid of and pull out, but a heat gun is gonna work really, really well. All right, so next theme with simplicity is print one at a time. Now this might have a little bit of variation, but let's say that you have two products that are gonna be sold. You can print them at the same time depending on how much volume you may have in your printer. And at least for me, it's like, okay, I can max this out. I think I could print nine on one and just barely fit it on the build plate and print it and it's gonna take, you know, nine days to print. But what happens is, is on day four, the printer has an issue. The nozzle gets clogged or some other million issues that can come up and the whole print is ruined. So you just wasted four days and don't even have one product. Versus if I would have just printed one a day, I would have had three products and the fourth one would have had the issue. So if they're like tiny little objects or something you're printing, that might not always apply. But another great thing you should look into is the sequential printing. I've done it on the Prusa Slicer and Cura, but you can, depending on the size and whatnot, have it you know, on the back left part of the build plate print one, then move over to the back right, print one. So it's gonna print one at a time. So that way if something does happen 75% of the way through your print, you still have those other units that are finished. So just use your best judgment would be my opinion. And I would be hesitant to go more than 24 hours, you know, print 24 hours at a time. So that way you don't lose all that. Another tip is when it comes to supports, unfortunately, something that doesn't really get said too much out there is, Supports pretty much only work with a 0.2 millimeter layer height. So I spent a lot of time trying different nozzles, different layer heights to try to make it print faster, but the supports would get stuck and they wouldn't break off clean and nice and leave a really good finished product. So if you're gonna print something with supports, use a 0.2 millimeter layer height. If somebody out there can figure out how to make them come off nice and clean, using larger layer heights, drop it in the comments because I definitely want to know about it. All right, some other things to think about is that, you know, if you're running a print farm, it is a little bit of a worry, right? If you're going to put this in somewhere where you're going to be like hanging out, they're pretty loud. I mean, nowadays they can get them relatively quiet, but it's not like you're going to want to be watching TV next to these. They make a lot of noise. They move around. Most people say, you know, it's not that bad. You don't have to worry about it. But I didn't like the idea of the fumes. You know, I'm printing PETG. You have to print it at a higher temperature and the PFTE tube can off gas some like neurotoxins. So I switched all mine and made sure that they were all metal hot end. But even then, you know, this does put off just a slight little bit of fume, which isn't a big deal. But if it's going 24 seven in your house, just made me worry. They're relatively safe nowadays, but they're a fire hazard. You know, you're dealing with 240 degrees Celsius hot end and trusting this little microchip to turn it off if something goes wrong, but 3D printers have caused fires in the past. So what I did is I bought this fireball, hoping that if a fire did catch, the ball would explode, put out the fire. Just some things that you might not think about until you're deep in it and you might be like, eh, I really wish I would have thought about this before I started doing it. Some other great tips is you know, using software, um, Octoprint is great. The Spaghetti Detective is great. Basically, you can have a little camera watching your prints. You can do it all remotely. You don't have to actually, you know, run a little chip back and forth between the printer. And the Spaghetti Detector is great because if something goes awry mid-print, it's gonna stop the print, not waste a bunch of plastic. Um, if you're gonna make a print from, you're gonna want steady shelves and you're gonna want the shelves relatively deep. So I'll put a link to one that I bought on Amazon, the one I was originally using, and then the new ones I'm using, I'll also put a link to that, but it's uh, Uline, and those are great because you can really customize it to different sizes, different depths, different heights, that sort of thing to accommodate your printers. But, you know, it doesn't have to be crazy sturdy, but if it's pretty wobbly, the printers are gonna be going, it's gonna be wobbling around, but I would go the sturdier route and then making sure they're at least two foot deep or three foot deep, because I know a lot of shelves come like, you know, 18 inches or something like that. And a lot of the printers are not gonna fit on there. All right, so I realized my situation is probably pretty unique and you might be like me and you see a 3D printer and you think, well, oh, that's like a employee that doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, complain, or even wanna get paid. I'm gonna get a hundred of them and I'll be rich. Unfortunately though, I don't wanna be the bearer of bad news, but I really just don't think that that is reality and that's what it's gonna be like. Now don't get me wrong, like. 
I do think 3D printing can be lucrative and you can make money at it. But if you're thinking about it like, hmm, I'm just looking for a side hustle and a way to make some extra cash on the side, I really don't think it's gonna be that for you. If anything, I think it'll end up turning into like a hassle and a headache rather than that. But on the flip side of that, if you are truly passionate about 3D printing and you like to tinker and learn about CAD and design and all that kind of stuff, then I do think you can turn this into, you know, a career or a good living. In the beginning, I think it's gonna be really difficult to make money, you probably won't make much, and there's gonna be a little bit of a learning curve, but it'll at least make your passion of 3D printing a more financially viable pursuit. And there's a lot of different ways you can make money with 3D printing or something similar to it. One good exercise you could do if you're interested in this is just get onto Etsy, type in 3D printing and see what's there. You're gonna see people will be selling the service of designing stuff to 3D print. People even just sell files that you can 3D print and then people are selling 3D prints for a profit and you can actually go onto their profile, see how long they've been on Etsy, figure out how many items they've sold, figure out what they're charging, just multiply what they're charging by how many items and then divide that by the years they've been on there and you can kind of see how much they've been making each year or roughly an average. And you'll find this isn't like a get rich quick scheme, but like I said, if you're passionate and you put in the time, I do think you can make a good honest living from this. And hopefully those tips and tricks and advice I gave you can help you make decisions and along your way. I really appreciate you guys watching. If you wanna help me out, like, comment, or subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.